My name is Mark Mayer. I am the senior educator for contemporary art here at the Asian Art Museum. Uh, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's lecture by Kulapat Yantrasast, Design as Ecology, which launches our second year of this annual lecture series, Asian Architecture Today. This series was created in collaboration with CCA's architecture division, and I'm excited that we have an opportunity to continue to cultivate this relationship and build stronger connections between the museum and architecture students as well as professionals in, in the field. When this lecture series was initially conceived, inviting Kulapat was always part of the plan especially because through the Asian Art Museum's upcoming expansion and renovation, the institution has actively been participating in conversations about architecture and design, and hence becoming part of this living practice. There was a vague recollection I remember of a phrase that Kulapat uttered during a presentation in response to a question about the unique challenge of designing in the museum's expansion within the confines of this Beaux-Arts building to which he mentioned the f or uttered the phrase in, in an Asian aesthetic or in an Asian style. And that was something that sat with me a little bit in terms of how that approach to architecture or what we understand as architecture could be made more complex and thought of differently, especially here in the United States. It made me curious and interested about a different kind of proposition about our museum and what if visitors to the Asian Art Museum were asked to engage with our collection through design? How might this shift the visitor's experience or the way a general audience might approach Asian art? Uh, so in some way, this idea sparked this lecture series. And it is my hope that by featuring some of the most prominent voices in architecture, while it might seem like a stark difference to the artwork in our galleries, that it creates a a sense of continuity that might be unexpected between design, innovation, and craftsmanship. I wanted to take a, this opportunity to actually thank CCA, and specifically Lisa Finley and the staff of the Architecture Division for working with us to actually co-produce this series. We look, we're very much looking forward to our next lecture by Pitzker Prize winner, um, Wang Shu of Amateur Architecture Studio, which is taking place on Thursday, March 29th. And just for all of you to take note, the tickets will go on sale next week, so check our website or come by the museum and pick them up before they sell out. And without further ado, um, I would like to welcome our collaborator, Lisa Finley, to the stage. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, this, uh, as Mark mentioned, this collaboration with this lecture series is in its second year. And CCA Architecture Division is really delighted to be collaborating with the museum uh, again to bring this venue uh, to this venue. Architects who work either in Asia or whose practices, ideas, and identities are deeply rooted there. And I'm quite honored to have the role of introducing tonight's lecture. Kulapat was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand, where he went on to graduate with honors from Thailand's premier university, Chula Longkorn. Afterward, he moved to Japan to study at the University of Tokyo, where he completed both his Master of Architecture and his PhD degrees under a Japanese government scholarship. Upon graduating, Kulapat worked in Japan for eight years on a wide range of mostly European and US-based projects with the Japanese Pritzker Prize laureate uh, Tadao Ando. In 2003, Kulapat co-founded Why Architecture, love that, Why Architecture, right? Um, in Los Angeles with former Tokyo University classmate Yoichiro Hakamori. While Hakamori has since moved on, Kulapat has nurtured Why, building upon those early successes to create a world-renowned practice that currently has offices in both Los Angeles and New York, each with around 15 staff members. Given his wide-ranging international background and steeping in radically different cultural context, it's not surprising that Kulapat frames architecture through a cultural lens. 
This frame is large, and it generously accommodates the robust ecology and collaborative nature of his practice. Among, in, within his practice, there are three overlapping workshops. The W in Y stands for workshop. The firm designs through these at all scales, from objects to buildings to landscapes. Now these are all framed by a fourth workshop that focuses on research, on the pursuit of new ideas and creative modes of engagement. I think you'll be talking more about that this evening, right, Kulipat? Kulipat is the recipient of the honors way too numerous to list here, um, but the highlights include the following. In 2009, he was the first architect to receive the Silpathkorn, sorry if I mispronounce that, award for design from Thailand's Ministry of Culture. In 2012, I love this, in 2012, he was named one of the art world's 100 most powerful people by Art and Art Auction Magazine, and I have yet to find out what that means. I'll have to, we'll have to find out, maybe he'll tell us tonight. And then in 2015, he was appointed a board member at the Pulitzer Foundation of the Arts in St. Louis. And we've come to find out this evening, he actually worked on that building, the Pulitzer Foundation building, while he was in Ando's office. So as an Asian architect who was nurtured in one Asian country, came of age, was educated, and cut his professional teeth in another, and then moved to the Mosaic City of Los Angeles, where he assembled an award-winning portfolio of cultural projects, including museums. Kulipat is an ideal person to be designing the next phase of the Asian Art Museum here in San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming Kulipat to the stage. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, after that, I don't know what to do, but try to do my part, but thank you. That was a very thoughtful introduction, and I'm very grateful for everyone to be here. So, uh, I feel like I'm speaking to my own family here because, you know, I've been in this museum for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of friends and families in the audience. And um, so, I am really appreciate uh, that you all come here today. And so what I want to talk about today, apart from the work, which I think, you know, is important, but I would like to talk about how I designed our practice and how I see basically the future of architecture, which is, I think, is an important uh, issue that we're facing in this diverse society where architects should play uh, a deep role in contributing not only buildings but ideas and also a sense of coming together which I think architecture still have the power to do and of course weave in the work that we're doing here so you get a preview a little bit of preview of uh, what we're trying to do which will be rolling on into you know, constructions and things uh, very soon so, as mentioned, this is our office in Los Angeles. We have around 15 and 15 in New York. I think uh, that's part of that. Um, my, you know, I think Lisa did a, such a great job about that. But it's kind of started where, where I am. You know, this is the world. And this is Thailand, uh, which is the, con the con country in the pink area, if you can imagine. And then uh, it's a kind of a country in the middle. Whereas Japan over there in yellow is uh, at the edge. And I say that because, of course, we are Asians, but we are very different. You know, what I talked about, like, like Thailand is like a little person between uh, giants in coach. So you have China and you have India, right? So imagine you as a tiny little person dealing with two big civilizations. So what do you do in this situation? Not just all your, your, all your elbows, you learn to behave. Like the Chinese are doing this thing, the Indians are doing this thing. You in this thing called Indochina. So okay, so you're flexible, you're diverse, you're eclectic, you combine. Japan <laughs> is himself a workaholic in the last row in coach. He has a whole sea to himself, right? He's so isolated, no one bother him. He just deal with culture, he's deal with it on his own. And I think that tell a little bit about that because, you know, we all who we are, 
and it reflects most of the things through food. And the reason why I talk a lot about food and architecture is because I, I want people to love architecture as much as they love food. I want people to have opinions. I want people to to have you know there's no bullshit in food. I want less bullshit in architecture as well. I think it's important to do that. Food is a, a saving grace for culture because no matter how you hate other culture, you will eat it. You will let it in your body, right? You have curiosity. You allow other cultures to be part of you, even though you may or may not like that those people. So let's kind of let food teach us a lesson. That we all can actually benefit from each other's heritage, and I think that because of that, and so coming back to you know the miller seed and the rose seed, Japanese food really represent who Japan has been, which is isolated in its own thing. It go in and get influence from different places, China and Korea, and be able to kind of be in this own little seed in a bag and keep refining and refining and refining about it. So the culture is so independent and clear. You know, Japan. Who you know, I, as Lisa mentioned, I came out of Asian. It's about the purity. It's about the clarity of thought. It's about the structure of it. You know, there's one singular voice, just like you know, anyone that tastes a sake or a sushi will understand. The strings is in that that aspect of clarity. Thai food is the opposite. Thai food is like we want everything at once. We want sweet, spicy, fatty, and all of this. We want Indian and Chinese, and we want all of this. But you know, for me, growing up in Thailand, you know, in a place we can talk a little bit about this, like for a small little country who kind of kind of be able to kind of have a contribution to the world, as in. We actually know how to put shit together. I'm sorry, to put things together that actually have a flavor. It doesn't look like a mush, and it have a sense of identity. I think that's kind of interesting. So I always feel, you know, now coming back to architecture a little bit, that the Japanese food way of thinking, including Japanese architecture, is actually the model for the 20th century. You know, when we love clarity. Form follows function. We love how the thought and the execution completely connect. There's no fuss about it. It's so clear and beautiful and efficient. We no longer into the 21st century, and we all know now the only way to survive is to learn to love the others. How diversity, how varieties, how inconsistency can be part of your creation is the future. You know, it's, we no longer work, live in a world that one person can design a whole city. You know, it will need a thousand people listening to another thousand people to create the best city for everyone. And that's when Thai food come in, because Thai food learn at least you know by trying to meet work with different people. You know, the Chinese said this, the, Jap the Japanese said this, the Indian said this. How can we blend all these things together and make it our own? And that's what architects today are facing, and I think a lot of them still want to practice it in in, in the Japanese word, uh, food of being. There are opportunities for that to cre create this isolated moment, but in the urban, you know, kind of public component, to be inclusive is something that we all need to learn to be, and obviously not being taught in school because it's still part of the system. So at the same time, you know, I also want to talk about, you know, our uh, uh, the subject today is design as ecology, and it's not design as ecosystem, because it needs to be learned, it needs to be researched in order for you to be part of it. It doesn't happen by itself, and I think it's so important for us to think that way, because of course, I mean, going back to what I started with, you know, we are what we we were because you know we happen to be between China and India, not because of choice, but because of where we settle, and we kind of make with that. Japan, where that we were, because they settled there, and then so all of these things happen to you. Just like okay, this is Bangkok, and this is the the the, the uh, palace and the capital. It was nice, and then we 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 really modernize. We receive modernism as part of our culture. 
we received these, and this, as I was growing up in Thailand, this is what it looked like, and this is what it looked like today. So in a way, we try to reconcile you know, our own heritage, and our own being from many, many thousands of years ago with modernism. So we are who we were, but we also what we are who, what we eat. And in this case, I question, do we really digest what we eat? You know, when we take in modern culture, when we take in modern architecture, because we like it, because it's different, do we actually digest and allow that to be part of our own body, our own cultures? And that's the problem that I struggled with when I was growing up in Thailand. Because I felt that, why am I living in a city in the tropical with a lot of skyscrapers with glass? Why am I living in a house that looked like a traditional house with leather sofas? Why am I living in this, you know? So it's a lot of things that doesn't seem to make sense, but I felt like, oh wow, because we want to be seen as civilized and really participating in the modern culture. And that's always been my kind of crisis or my identity crisis, shall we say. And that's part of the reason why I went to Japan for my education. Because uh, I come to my realization when I was in Thailand, so, well, the only way for me to learn is not to go to a country that create modern culture. I have to go to a place that receive modern culture, be able to blend it with their own culture, and really make it well. Make it into something that, you know, you adopt something that you import, and you turn something into something else, and you give it back to the whole world as your contribution. So these are some of my heroes. For example, Luis Barragan, which we just talked, who is Mexican, heavily in, influenced by Le Corbusier, going back to Mexico and feel like I cannot work in Mexico like I would work in Paris. What else can I get back to look at my roots and bring that quality, the global local? Amazing, you know, the, the second person who win the Pritzker after Philip Johnson, who founded the prize, and then really send amazing influence to the rest of the world, not just for Mexico. Oscar Niemeyer, who's another person, you know, the right man at the right time. He was the right time when Brazil was who was a new country in the 50s, looking for identity, also heavily influenced by Le Corbusier, also actually worked with Le Corbusier on his first project in Brazil, understand what needs to be done to really create a new identity for a new country, which is Brazil, and bring out a new aesthetic, which no one haven't seen. Completely modern, but completely sensitive to who he was. And then, of course, Ando, who was my mentor, and that's part of why I was interested in, because, you know, it doesn't look like a Japanese temple, but it has a spirit of a Japanese sense of sanctuary. And the way that he learned from Corbusier, the way he learned from Frank, Frank Rai Rai, the way he learned from Miss Van der Rohe, but he actually digests them. He, he doesn't do that as a symbol of civilization. He do that because he felt he needed to participate in the world outside and the world inside. And that's where I was interested in these people. So I'm saying that because I felt that architecture is at a crisis moment. You know, back in the 50s, Miss Van der Rohe said, less is more. And then in a postmodern time, you know, Venturi said, less is a bore. And then later, uh, Philip Johnson said, I'm just a sty whore. I can just do anything. You know, you want eclectic, you want postmodern, you want deconstruction. I can do all of it because architecture is forgiving, is, is what it is. So we, we kind of in this a void of you know, ideology, you know, not that we need one, but I think there's an anchor that needs to take place. So all this happened, and sadly, is because architecture kind of lost its connection to society in general. Architecture used to be that sheltering art form that everyone looked to when there's a new building going up or a temple. Everyone's like, yes, that represents who we are in 19, you know, 75. This represents who we are in 1950s. Right now, architecture lost a power. No one cares. It become a rich person's game. The rest of the population do not have the capacity to commission architecture. You know, they still have the capacity to commission food, but not architecture. So therefore, architecture lost a connection with people just by it becoming this obsolete, self-obsessed art form. So I'm trying to get back to where we were as a close, public discourse that people should talk about. And that's what I'm interested in. 
And part of that is because of the myth. The architects are in this, for example, many of you might know this movie called The Fountainhead, an Ayn Rand novel that's made into a, a movie about this idealistic, completely you know, stubborn architect who just built his work as that. But the problem with that is that we're dealing with an architect who's a little bit like a lone wolf. And it's a problem because we all, even though how smart architect is, you kind of design in a bubble unless you really engage with people you're working with and what you're trying to do and, then, and the impact that the building should have. And so I'm here to kind of talk about design, not as it has been, but it, what I think it should be, is that how can architect, not as an ideal form maker, how can architect be an agent of change that could be a thought leader that work with a group of people, a community, towards a solution, you know, make the process more open and everyone come together. So that's what I'm kind of interested in. And I'm kind of in between the old model and new model. So that's part of that. So what is why, which is the name of our company? So, uh, and you know, when I started the office, you know, with Yo, which is 2004, uh, you know, it's not like a like other architects' office. And then very quickly, I realized, like, like, oh my God, like, if you, you know, we, we both have PhDs, so we felt like we have really good hammers. So we felt like, well, really, when you get half hammers, everything looks like a nail to you. You you make every problem in your life architectural. And it doesn't have to be, because sometimes the solution is actually landscape. Sometimes the, 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 the solution is actually interdesigned or even master plan or whatever, right? But when you're kind of within this hammering, hammering mode, everything looked like a nail to you. So I felt that was such a dangerous point in my life. So I quickly feel like, well, the only way that I can actually get out from that hammer effect is to try to get a whole toolbox. So I need to surround myself with who, people who think differently and work differently. So that's when we started diversifying from an architectural office into a, a workshop. And when we do that, you, we start with four things. Uh, building was still our biggest and you know, most maybe original part of it. We quickly find landscape because we felt that a lot of solutions that we're trying to make is actually could be solved with landscape better than building. But you need uh, different tools to be able to deal with that. We also start to know that a lot of time, People do not have the access to good questions. You know, as architect, you kind of have to respond to as answers to your client. But you know, it's very difficult to have a refresh answers if you don't have refresh questions. So we need to help our client define what a question they should ask. For example, this museum. What is this museum? What is supposed to do? You know, not that the clients, but to engage in that process of thinking and asking questions before you try to apply answers. I felt that's quite rewarding to do, and I think it's important. Not that because the client doesn't know, but, but sometimes we need to ask this question to more people, to more stakeholders, to more users, to people that didn't come to this place, as to how can this place be relevant to more people. So that's kind of part what our ideas workshop started is because let's not jump to design, let's do, you know, aspect of thinking. And an object is because architecture takes a long time and it's very difficult to sustain my staff concentration on a long period of time, sometimes five years, 10 years. So to have small projects, insulation, furniture design, allow people to be able to sustain their interest in a lot of things. In order to, to take a, a long journey, you need living step to go ahead. So the object is part of make it more of a, a vibrant human journey. So this is how we start. This is some of the advice. You know, I'm not here to say that this is perfect, but at least it's my choice. And I think the only way is this way, because I don't know how I can go back and just do architecture like I used to do when I first started. And so we try very hard to mix our studio together. You know, I become the, the ringleader, so I'm trying to kind of sell services to a variety of people. I, you know, people are like, oh, I, we only want a building. No, 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 you don't want a building. You want 
an outreach. You want to question. You need, you know, socializing the program and all of these to kind of try to get the clients or the city to play along with it. So this is a part of our thinking and how we try to create these constellations of uh, thinking about it. But one other thing that I, t I talk to my staff a lot is that we're actually not in the form business. We're in the people business. Like in the sense that, and this is funny because I heard this from Howard Schultz from Starbucks. He said that he's not in the coffee business, he's in the people business. And when you think of yourself as not in the coffee business, that you're in the people business, you actually think about it differently. Right? You think, how do people stay here? How do they socialize? How do I bring music into my service? How do they bring other things to this? Because at the end of the day, I think architecture is actually not a form business. It's actually in the people business. But we like it to be, to be a form business because it's easier for us to control. So that's something I felt is important for my, for, for, for my staff to know that the form doesn't solve itself itself. Even though you love your form, at the end of the day, there's people that need to be part of it. So that's kind of what I want to do, talk about, and really talk about food as a notion. So this is kind of our manifesto. Um, so I'm going to go through the project quickly. I mean, just uh, we're not here to explain what they are. So this is our installation that we work with at Design Gallery in New York that we install and create objects for them, including uh, the uh, the furniture part of it. This is the lamp that we designed based on our architecture projects uh, in the speed. We really believe in making and doing as much as thinking. So we always fail and try to push ourselves towards that end. It's our staff trying to make glass uh, work. You know, this is the result of it. And this is part of you know, how we make the share out of uh, salvage uh, materials. That's part of that. Um, I might go a bit fast because I you know, have many slides to talk about. So this is how we try to kind of connect our workshop together, you know, buildings, ideas, and grounds. For example, this is our first project finish, uh, which is in 2007. Uh, it's the first lead grow museum in, in the world, actually. Uh, it occupied a whole block in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You know, I think it, uh, it's a concrete building, and uh, uh, it have a flexibility of it. This is me. Um, uh, so, you know, we were talking about how can really, not only from inside out, that a museum is a place f for art and people to get together, but from an outside in, how it can be a real cultural hub. How can this place be about art presentation, but art production? which I think is important, that it's not an isolated temple, that it has inspired people to, to look at art, but inspire people to actually make art. So how is that role a museum should play in that? This is the interior of that museum. It's you know rather simple, a lot of light and flexibility. And because it's, it's a lead goal building, we talked a lot about what make a museum sustainable. And I always come down, it's not that complicated, but for me, it really comes down to the elements, right? The earth, water, light, air, and fire. The earth is, you use material sensitively. You use recyclable material, local material, something you feel that you have to spend arms and legs to get. Water is that you want to be able to be intelligent about using water from recycle and aspect. And this, I think water is important to also make people aware of where they are. Light and air is a big part of museums because we, you know, and I made a mistake of calling uh, a museum as a refrigerator of art, you know, uh, when I was interviewed for the New York Times because I felt like people don't realize how much mu energy museums consume. When you think about maybe not this space, but in the galleries 24-7, the gallery is being kept at exactly temperature with humidity all the time, whether you're there or not. When you think about it, you know, your, your rituals still have a fluctuation of time. A gallery, a museum gallery, do not have that. So if you're going to spend all this energy preserving this artwork, what does it mean for you to have that relevancy to people? So that's something I think is important for us to think about the energy usage and the light, of course, and the energy is part of that. So this is the museum in Grand Rapids, you know, that's part of that. And it's really been uh, 11 years and it go back every year and it's really become, we were at the right place at the right time because it become a hub of the city. Downtown has re rebirthed in a meaningful way and really become a living room for the city. 
The other project I talked about is uh, the Speed Art Museum, which is nothing about cars. It's just the name of the family that uh, built the building uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And this is um, the building in 1927. It was built, you know, just a little bit you know, later than this building. It was built as temple of art in a classic American sense. This American Beaux-Arts building, zero windows. You know, if you don't know art, don't bother, come close. And this is what it is today, which is still, you know, the same temple, completely isolated. And most kids feel intimidated to get even close by, especially in this case, because we also deal with a very diverse black and white community where, you know, kids from minorities never even felt they even allowed legally to get into these places. So it's a really difficult history we're dealing with in, in this country. So what I did is, this is Mrs. Speed. So I kind of was channeling her, uh, like, how do museums grow? Well, museums grow sometimes like a toad to try to kind of blow it up to get like, look how big I am. I'm so powerful and awesome. I'm big here, which is, you know, you know animals do that. Or you grow like Frankenstein, like, oh, I have this body, but this arm is being done by another person, this head is another person, so all these organs and wings are stitched together into this kind of thing. So I was went going through this, like, well, I really do. Are these really the only options that museum can go through, either to blow them yourself up or like stitch up into a collage? So I kind of was thinking deep down, and this is going what to Mark says, like, okay, what can I offer which is different? So, you know, I was quickly thinking about acupuncture. Because, and this happened, you know, uh, at a few projects I worked on that I have to deal with old building. Because I always feel like, well, first of all, you know, you're not doing, you know, I don't want to do plastic surgery because that's kind of not long lasting and it's kind of all superficial. So I felt like, well, the, the best way to deal with history or all things is to believe that it has energy, it has power. So once you believe that something has power, your job is not to try to replace that power. Your job is to try to act, ignite a power and expand it, which is a kind of an Asian kind of thinking, I guess. So I feel like, okay, well, well Funny because I was on a trip with uh, actually Mrs. Pulitzer. We were in Japan together, and I was being interviewed for the job. And she was asking me like, "What do you think about this?" And it's like I feel like when I get into the building, I felt like I'm I had a flu. It kind of everything's stuffy and everything is very difficult to see. And I felt like the best way for me is almost like to put in like acupuncture, so everything just kind of like clarifies, like a clear. And and she said, well, "Wow, that's good. Use that," which I did. And so I think that has been a little bit my mode of operation in a sense that, you know, like believing in energy that exists before you assists it to kind of move on, clarify, and defragmentalize what you see and allow the life that happened to you to go into the future. You know, I think with architecture, you know, I think we touch it on a very short time. You know, let's say I touch this building, hopefully people in the next generation doesn't look back and say, this is a mess. So I'm trying to do something that is not short-lived, that allow people to move forward and allow this building, this life that happened before us and will continue after us to continue. So that was kind of the key to this acupuncture. And for the speed, it's kind of like that, including like this museum. We start by looking at all the points that we can actually activate. How can this body, this museum, be activated both inside and outside? Inside is how can the flow and the circulation be better? How can the experience be clear and easy and inspiring? The outside is how can this solid building that do not know how it relates to, the, how it can be open to the outside, smell the flowers, people can understand what's going on. So all of this is happening in and around the museum. So the key was the, the whole entire site is a museum, it's not just a building. The gardens, the landscape, the street, about that, we start by kind of, even before we have a design, we start to prescribe these acupuncture points that should allow us to really focus on key areas that allow this to kind of be, you know, a sustainable and vibrant body for this, the before or after. And the other thing that I talk a lot about is, um, you know, I use the word uh, from peacock to octopus. And what I mean by that is that uh, most buildings are planned as a peacock is elegant and majestic, but it's very centralized. For example, this museum, you know, I mean, not that we, you know, name names. So in order to use this room, 
the whole museum has to be open, right? I mean, how many guards are, are there? How many people to do there? I mean, the guards might like that, but so you know, so that's why you don't see events as much as this because it takes an effort to 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 keep something open. There's nothing spontaneous about this. So I kind of like I kind of trying to kind of advocate away from this centralized museum program. You get into this grand hall, from the grand hall you go to the galleries and coffee shops and libraries and all of that, which make the whole thing have to open at the same time because it's one being. It looks grand, but it's not practical. So whereas the octopus is different, the octopus, I don't know whether you know, but each of the tentacles have its own brain. So if you, if you cut a tentacle, it can grow into its own animal which I, for me is decentralized. So if this can be its own thing, yes, it can actually do a program on its own wing without having to open the whole body. But then these also become these tentacles or interaction that allow people to go back in the museum. People might come for food, but then they stay for the art. People might come for events, but they stay for the art. And not everything has to be open at the same time. So most of my museum design has been trying to take this kind of decentralized planning so that different pieces of the museum can actually have their own life and program without having to go through a whole organization you know, admin, which is completely difficult for most of the time. So that's it is, the museum, an old building and a new building. Because the old building is very isolated, so this, this all whole thing, it, it makes it look big, much bigger than this, it but it's actually around 80,000 square feet, the new building. And we, f we feel like we need to have a dynamic moment, so the gallery is on the second and third, and then the public space is on the first. Uh, we're using these kind of rather inexpensive aluminum uh, panels to cre create a sense of character which is in a way started from the reference to the moldings of the old building, but we do it vertically so that, you know, dust doesn't collect. So that's part of that. It's an inside, so you're in the lobby looking at the history and you kind of reflect back, so that's part of that. And the water is kind of a way to kind of connect the two together. So all of that. So now here. So I think, well, I think as I have some more slides, I'm going to go faster. So for, for here, you know, it continued that um, acupuncture aspect to even a higher level. You know, this is maybe the most intact and important historic civic center in the country. You look at City Hall, you look at the auditorium, you look at all these places. Of course, you know, it's been compromised by Tenderloin, by Market Street, and all that. But when you look down at it, you know, there's no other cities in the country that have this intact sense of place. So we kind of want to make sure that we don't screw it up. At the same time, you know, what we learned about it is like, it's great, but no one get in because it's become urban facades that nothing have inside really relate to the outside. So we want to fix it. So, you know, when we start, it starts from inside. We, wouldn't, we didn't plan on adding anything to it. We felt like, well, we really want to focus on the galleries, on the art. But then we realized, like, well, we really have to stay open uh, during our renovation, our transformation. So the only way for us to be able to stay open is be able to add space so that we can swing it in phases. So when we, you know, we build the pavilion first, and then we can do program in there, renovate the galleries, and when the gallery is ready, we move it back and finish. You know, so that's that's some kind of uh, space enough for us to be able to kind of move things around. Right now we bring at the seam, so it's impossible to even think about working here without, uh, you know, kind of jeopardizing the, the operation. So there's part of that. So in this case, you can see, you know, the city hall over there, we, you're looking at Fulton right here, and the building around. And so we add this pavilion, which is in the back, which is around 10,000 square foot, with an art terrace in the top, the gallery itself, which is a flexible, large, column-free space, and then a lounge on High Street. So the thought was that, you know, a lot of people are coming through here. We want to have a gateway. We want something that people feel welcome. People know, of course, the building wasn't built for the Asian Art Museum, so it felt a little bit like a hermit crab, that as a museum, you come and you occupy the public library, and then you try to make it your own home. It wasn't built as a museum, so the spaces are kind of skinny and long. So, you know, this is the first time to try to help to make some better spaces. So that was part of the effort, and, going to, and we want to activate high street as well as the corner. 
This is another view. This is from McAllister and High, which you can see that. We try to integrate the loading dock in there. The skin on the building, uh, which is a big subject for pre historic pre preservation, is that we create this out of terracotta tiles, which is you know a historic, you know part of the auditorium building. As you have a terracotta tile, not this one, but we try to kind of uh, maintain the module of the tiles. You can see that, so it's the same module with the granite on the base. We would take it over, but we want to to bring in a sense of contemporary technology to it. So these are really kind of advanced production. The windows on the back is kind of faceted because I felt like. It, it kind of play on from uh, the tie itself. But I also want to, you know, make uh, Guy Olenti fell at home. I mean, she's no longer with us, and, she, you know, she, this is one of her work, and, and if you talk to most people, most people feel like it's not the be her best work. But I felt like she's part of this family, even though, you know, she might be like a very eccentric aunt that you don't know how to relate to, but she needed to be part of this because she's part of this legacy. So I kind of tried to kind of add her back into this kind of facet as part of this togetherness of our Asian Art Museum family. So as, at the same time, on the rooftop, it's function as a place you can look at the area around, you know, have a visual connection. And we really need for outdoor space for, you know, children to have lunches and events and all of that. And day and night. So, for example, this is a perfect moment to show this image because if you go out that door, right there, you're coming out from there. So right now, you know, I think in the uh, party uh, of this old building, you arrive on Larkin, you come back and you kind of go up on this beautiful grand stair in the larger space, you arrive in here, but then you really like, where am I? So now if you go up that stair, you're gonna look into High Street so you know exactly where you are. I think it's important for you know, art experience and civic experience to locate people in a city. Like you, you look at the Mona Lisa, you know exactly you're in Paris. You look at something at the Frick, you know exactly you're in New York, because that's a civic pride that art can bring. And in this case, we have to. Someone has to be looking at this amazing masterpiece like, oh, I'm in San Francisco. This is why this is so important. And then you think about people that did it for you, and you think about what you do for later. All of these is all simple and human nature, but we just need to activate it. Again, as you arrived in, you know, now you have a long bar of counter that you don't see anything, so we're gonna simplify that. The first thing you see is that this will be a rather contemporary art context in the lobby, and you look right into the grand stairs and uplift you. You know, what Guy Ellington did was she moved the core of the circulation to the south, to the escalator and the elevators. So it kind of de cripple, I mean, crippled the building because the Beaux-Arts composition actually want everything to go symmetrical. But quickly, we go to the south, and then it, it render, you know, the grand stairs and the lodge as a decoration rather than a circulation. So we want to bring it back to that notion. We want to bring Samsung as a focus of that as well. The lobby will more or less be similar. We, we you know, try to work within uh, the context we have to create more of a welcoming aspect. This is within the pavilion, which is going to be just right out there uh, under the art terrace which is gonna be one of the largest column-free space in the city, so we can do large installations, and not just only contemporary art, but other things. Many of you who are fans of this museum know that, for example, you know, uh, Couture Korea, you have to go through four rooms to get the story. Now you have more flexibility. You can show small and big art together. There's room to go back into. So it gives the experience a little more flexibility. At the same time, it, it was built not just for exhibition. You can do forums, you can do parties, you can do dance and other things. So it built as a flexible space, a black box for a variety of reasons. So that was that. And we also be touching on education, which is a big part of this museum. How can we, you know, not only just art appreciation, but how learning about art is about culture. So that's something that we will, you know, we will work with the existing space, but really vamp it up and make it more flexible and easy to use in a variety of formats. So that's what we do. So now being self, so it's just my house. So just, you know, so, so that's to be coming, and I'm quickly going on my thing. This is where I live every day, uh, indoor, outdoor. And I'm showing that because I think it feel like I need to show some architecture. So this is my house, it's fully concrete, um, indoor, outdoor. This is my eclectic thing. This is my office having an outing. 
over there as part of that. And now we're moving, there. so we just finished this museum, uh, which is uh, the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. But maybe something worth saying about this is that it's a very, it turned uh, a lemon, a lemon to a lemonade, and in, in it's, it's a very, basically, uh, it's just any warehouse in downtown LA that we turned to a rather successful art program with its limitations. It only have one access to the front, so it, it, you know, the front and the back and everything have to come together. So let's do that. Let's make it a transparent, all encompassing museum. We start to think about how different, again, I mean, for me, by now, I hope you, it's like, I'm, I'm really into people. I want people to like people. I want people to like art. I want synergy to happen in the spaces. This is not a tea room moment. This is a cultural making moment. So that's kind of who I am as, a, as an architect. So even though I like a tea room just like the next guy, for me, for, uh, uh, in this day and age, if people show up for something, we, we need to give them something that you cannot do on the internet. Right, interaction, the spirit, the inspiration from seeing other people is what we crave in architecture. So that's part of that. It's a space, the first show. This is, and again, it's, I mean, I didn't design this, it already exists, but I just enhance the quality of the space, it already exists. This is another project we did in for Pomona College, which is an art making, and this is for the college, but it's, it's the, the uh, studio art hall. Again, the idea of coming together of the different art forms making under a roof, uh, really related to the, the, the campus, which is around 100 years old, designed by Marin Hunt. So how to relate to this historic, just like this building. You know, and I believe that, that the best way to respect someone is actually to be yourself, to not try to do something else. Uh, the integrity, the old integrity and the, old, the, the new integrity will find a way to like each other. But if you start to stop away from yourself, that's when you lose yourself, that's when there's no respect to be had. So I think it's important. In this case, I try not to compromise. So that's the building in the context. The roof has this kind of gentle shape of the mountain around, and it kind of uniting out from, from the different uh, 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 studios together. Uh, it has turned into a very popular destination, not only for art students, but for the rest of the campus. And it's important because when we interview for the job, you know, I got to know the president of the college quite well, and he said, you know, the days that we produce artists are kind of long gone. Now our students are all lawyers and doctors and business people and all of that. But uh, I want them that when they sit in the boardroom and have to make decision whether to, to, to vote yes or no on an artwork, that they say yes. So I think, so this is not an esoteric art production at the edge of the campus that just for art see people. How can we make art making something that non-art people can understand, especially for you know, a geeky college like this. So I think it's important to have a sense of welcoming, allow people to see what's going on, transparency, serendipity, all of that is kind of the ingredients of planning, uh, drawing studios, and it has served that way. I mean, I'm self-serving in saying that, but if you talk to senior and promoter college now, they will tell you that this building has become student center, you know, I think non-art students are now doing parties and movie nights and all kind of dating things happening over there, so that's kind of a function of architecture, is all of that. And so this is collaboration, we work with a Thai artist, look with Tiravanish, who's uh, using a lot of food in his work to talk about how culture connect. We did a pavilion together, which is actually a tea room, a tea pavilion, but it kind of go over a river. There's one of these in, in, in Okayama, so this is kind of a little bit of a reference to that, but over the Alley River, which is in this case that way. We also did a master plan and project for Calats, which is an awesome art school in Valencia, in, in California. We work with the president and create this sense of how can we use the space we already have and really make it something different. And we try not to do design because the, the art students hate design. They don't want design to be, you know, kind of anywhere. So we kind of work, start by really listening and talking to people what they need. This is the before picture. This is the after. So all of that is a great success for that project as well. We design a lot of furniture for that regards and all of that. This is, I'm not going to go down to details, but we did uh, an exhibition uh, commissioned by the museum in L.A to talk about the history of LA without cars. 
I, I don't, I'm not going to go into detail, but we talked about how can you recycle the two parking lanes on all the boulevards in LA as almost a high line, because you have 10 feet on both sides. And imagine a car would go park itself, so a car would drop you off, it would go park itself in some kind of structure. When you need it, it would come back. And when you think about how much uh, urban spaces we earn by parking spaces, that the car doesn't need to be there, you can think about you know, gardens and mixture and low housing, layering cities and all these things. So that was part of that project that we proposed. We, this is another exhibition we work with the LA Public Library. And the reason why I show that because we want, I want to show something kind of designed. In this case, uh, we were commissioned by the public library to, to, to do an exhibition on uh, their menu collection. It has one of the biggest menu collection in the country, uh, from the menu from the Titanic to the menu when Einstein came to Caltech to give a talk and write things. So we using the opportunity to talk about immigration. So we decide, you know, first of all, I felt like menu should be seen as you sit down, not on a wall, and everyone should be welcome to sit down. And with the curator, we decided that this is a moment and we talked about immigration, we talked about food justice, talked about equality, and how can, you know, we're not just celebrating fancy banquets, but talked about who and who have not. And when you look at the history of food, the menu, you really find how sad it is that we have come to this point, and how do we celebrate one and not the other. So this is, you know, in a way, we designed what we call the, the welcome table, so this is the combination of a mashup of every combination of seating you can think. A banquet that Einstein sit at Caltech, that's a jail cafeteria, a Japanese Leslie Susan, there's a tea room, there's, you know, all of these roll into one connecting things. So when you sit down to look at that, you actually sit at the same table with everyone looking at the menu. So there was part of the exhibitions that we designed and it was a very popular thing that everyone see. Um, going on on the coll collaboration, so we've been working on a master plan of, for a park called Jackson Park in Chicago, which is in the south side. Um, oh, this is a good moment to use this. Uh, just a few more minutes, I'm almost done. Uh, so this is where the Obama Library is going. So we've been working on this before uh, the expression decided to move his library there, but now we're kind of in the middle of it. So we did a master plan to that. Uh, it, it is an Olmsted planning. Uh, it was designed for the uh, Pan Pacific uh, Pan uh, Columbia Exposition, and then Olmsted and Sons were invited back to plan to change the exposition ground into a park. So Jackson, Washington, and Midway Persons was part of the exposition. So anyone that read the book, The Devil and the White City, this is where it is. So that was part of that. Again, there's the idea of creating the aspect of that. Leo is turning that into a movie, so that's part of that. Uh, so the idea of trying to bring a sense of diversity, which is you know, what uh, Olmsted wanted, and uh, started to create a loop that allowed everything to happen. Right now, it's a, it's, it's a drug shooting site. So it's not, it's very sketchy to go. And now it's, so we talked about how can families, and we'll deal with you know, the black and white history of Chicago, which is a big part of how it was planned. It's a master plan that we did for, we collaborate with the Park District in Chicago. The first project we did was we invited Yoko, uh, who's a friend, to, because we felt that we need a launch into this. So we invited Yoko to create a land work of it, and she was so grateful. She's like, oh my god, this is the first time someone asked me to do something without asking for money. This is really good. So, so, you know, so that happened. So this is her work that we collab with her. She came up with a sketch. We implemented it and basically executed design. It's called Sky Landing, which is almost like this leaf of things coming from the ground. They all stellar steel with the art form around it which is at the opening uh, 18 months ago, uh, working with Yoko, who's 81, 82 years old now, and all of that. And then now the second phase, which is, uh, which is my design, is this Phoenix Pavilion. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go... So the reason why the, the Phoenix Pavilion is so important is because uh, for the exposition, many of you might know, uh, it's the first time that Chicago, you know, um, how something that international and it was a big ambition. It was a Burnham Olmsted master plan to do that. And the book rendered very well. But it's also the first time that Japan came out under, Japan, under American occupation. And so they spent 
you know, everything they could to bring what is called the Phoenix Pavilion to put right on the island in the middle of the expo. And it, it was made after Biodoin, which is uh, a temple, uh, a pure land sect, a temple in, in Uji, uh, and basically a replica of that. And it's the only structure that allowed to stay after the expo. And it was a beautiful, they send, you know, it was almost bankrupt the country to, to bring this because they bring all the workers. They, they want to show the world that even though they were, we, were, we were depressed, now we rise up from the ashes. And that's why the phoenix was the right symbol for them. And sadly, that building was burnt down during the Second World War, as we all know why. And so the site, and that's why yoga was perfect, was that the site is really talking about this love-hate relationship between American and Japanese relationship that happened well and not well, and then the war kind of put it. So for Yoko, who's a Japanese artist living in America, to talk about this relationship was beautiful. And that's why she proposed the idea of really getting together as a sky landing. So we did that. But this is the new uh, Phoenix Pavilion, not on the footprint, but in the parking lot to really create a new center for that park. It functioned as a museum, classrooms, you know, kind of nature watching area. And in the back, it functioned as, this is looking back at that, it functioned as a stage. Uh, so Olmsted designed this music court, which never been used because there's no stage for it. So the back side of it will get a, a stage for that. So this is a phase two for that master plan that's gonna be executed soon. And the whole thing is called Project 120 because it's 120 years uh, off after the expo, which is the Japanese, uh, this Kanreki, which is the, the cycles of 60. So now, almost done. Uh, this is the project that we did, uh, competition, and that's, that's when I start talking about how we really recruit people. Uh, every project we do, we recruit everyone we could to come in and talk about idea. This is uh, Pershing Square in uh, LA. That uh, We didn't win the competition, but I felt that for the very first time, I felt that we have a liberated process. That. I felt that we were making music together and we don't know whose idea it is, but it came out I mean, the most playing music. And I wasn't even a composer, we just kind of have enjoyed the ideas together as so I want to celebrate the team I work with. But then it lead up to another project that we did win, uh, which is uh, in, um, in Edinburgh, which is we won this uh, five months ago. Uh, it is a World Heritage Site. The castle is up there. And so we're doing the master plan uh, to uh, connect uh, the old city and the new city and accommodate uh, the performance art center, museums, cafe, children's, but you know, all garden combined to that. And, it, and, the, and the, last, the last that we did in LA, we found in uh, Edinburgh because uh, the approach that we practice deliver in this case. So we talked about how you connect the city together between the old and new, how to bring music and art together, how to bring people from you know, commercial street down to this refuge and up to this, uh, the, the, the castle again. This is part of our design, and it was, it was um, very unique and different from the other entries, and that part of the reason why we won, because we, we take a very different approach to it, and one which is very uh, public and inclusive. So this is last project, which is the project which we're just about to break ground. It's actually the first project we have in the office, which is a non-profit project we did uh, for an, uh, a bridge. Uh, it was a bridge crossing the LA River in North Hollywood. And so we decided, you know, when I went to the site, I was very angry how dirty the, the river was. It's called Los Angeles River, but it's really kind of not a river. And so I felt like, well, I was so angry. I felt like, well, we need to build a city from the trash people throw into it because this bridge is supposed to tell people what they are, like it's like a mirror to that. So we actually come up with a system that we cast the whole bridge out of salvage material we found from the river. And it takes forever for us to raise the money for it. And you know, all these things still intact with the trash and everything. And so it's crossing the river. It's around 120 feet across. And this is the wall uh, called the Great Wall of Los Angeles, which is built, uh, painted around 40 years ago that talked about the history of minorities and powers in Los Angeles. So this is kind of the platform. Uh, to, to help people to go to school, but at the same time as a platform for them to see how we treat water and how the history of the, of the city relate to the river. 
So that's all I have. So uh, last point is that this is, again, I think I'm advocating uh, for working together, decide together, and I'm uh, not every time I'm successful, but I'm here to advocate for uh, the future of design, which is part of our ecology. Thank you. So uh, it seems like the, the process you and, and the firm uh, uses to approach architecture and design thinking manifests in a really exciting way for cultural and institutional projects like museums and educational buildings. Uh, I'm curious, are you interested in pursuing this in commercial and retail projects and how do you see that uh, process applying? I, I think it's a it's a it's a great question. You know, uh, we started to work on commercial projects now. You know, I think it's I think it's even even have more relevancy for commercial architecture, or like urban development or mixed use. Uh, I, and I start to see that, but it's a different kind of purpose, right? Of course, because you know, for development, uh, there's always a profit which is part of it, which is tangible. When with cultural institution, the profit is not tangible. You kind of think what it is. But I think the, what I call socializing the program or mobilizing the stakeholder work for every kind of project, including even residential. Because I think if you socialize a program, which means that you allow the program to be discussed among different people, like what is this museum supposed to be to you, Right, so I'm not assuming that, oh, I know what museum should be, this is it, which is a very 19th century way of designing. Like, I'm a learned person, I'm a Renaissance man, I know exactly what a museum should look like, I'm gonna give one to you, right? But I mean, in the other way that if it's like, well, I know what a museum should be, but I don't know what a museum to you, to San Francisco, let's talk about what that could be. You know, and I think that in business, I mean, going back to your question, it helps a lot because in business, you want to be able to hit more than one bird with one stone, right? So you say, okay, you're gonna put $50 million on this development, and you think you're gonna hit that. What else, what other birds can you hit with that stone? And business people actually like to listen to that because everyone wants branding, everyone wants success financially, everyone wants you know, sustainable, popularity and growth and things of that sort, right? So if we can turn into what they want to listen to, I think it can work for everyone because at the end of the day, if you hold a key to people, you hold a key to the universe because people will make decisions. And if you have people on your, on your, on your part, every politician will listen to you, every developer will listen to you, every civic leader will listen to you because people are the key and that's why we're all here, yeah. Final question. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, what are the elements in the Asian Art Museum design on that street, I'm not sure what the name is, that, that will pull in pedestrians, people just walking by, you may not even know what the Asian Art Museum is. That's a very good point. And I think, um, maybe you can go back to the same images. So uh, one of the things that we did is we have this gallery lounge aspect. I'm sorry doing this to you. So I think we, th we thought a lot about that because we only have you know, a limit of, of money and we want every square foot to be used for art. I mean, Rob's standing, sitting over here, so he's doing that. So you know, we, we, we kind of want to have an open space that allows us to do that. Uh, I think there's one image in particular that will hopefully answer that question. Uh, so you know, we know that we want to activate High Street, right, which is, you know, which in a, in a way it's always a little bit of a leftovers. You know, this museum when it was renovated, it wasn't finished. It was to be supposed to be the first phase. We have the lodging dock on the corner of High and McAllister, and we have Fulton, but not no one can see inside. No one knows what's going on, and everyone passed by. Like it looked like a back side of a, of a building. Uh, we couldn't quite possibly create another entrance because it would make the circulation impossible, but we also want to have a gesture that this is the, the Asian Art Museum. So, oh, that look sexy, yeah. So what we can see here, or maybe even better in this one, 
is, you know, so in the pavilion, which is basically on the level uh, kind of uh, under us. Because, I mean, you might not notice, but the, uh, the land actually sloped down. So that if you're in the Samsung Hall right now, if you go out that door right now, you can actually be on the roof terrace, on the art terrace there, which is that. But then under that, we have an 18-foot ceiling pavilion, which is in this uh, space over here. At the end of it, you know, this area, which is around 2,000 square feet, we create this window, which is we call the gallery lounge. So it can be a place for social aspect. It can be a, a, you know, a place for art that can take some light. But it also be a place that you can look down and you can have a, because, and we intentionally make these windows so it wrap around the corner. So it, it go around the corner in this way, and it go and wrap around the other corner this way, because the corner is almost more important than the street because that's when you come up from Fulton, or McAllister, you need to be able to see that. And right now, you know, our loading dock is here, and I don't want to bo bore you with, but we also on a seismic bed which means that the area we can actually expand is limited. So we're basically building this pavilion on top of what already exists, so we don't have to expand. It would be immensely costly to expand more seismic ground around because you have to change the foundation for the building. So we're building up there, you know, but we want to activate the corner, so this is was part of that. And we also hope that on the art terrace, People will be seeing people up there. You know, there will be a variety of activities over here, art, people, and social. And on the ground level, you know, one thing that the city is concerned about too is our homeless population in Civic Center. How do we engage that? So we want to create this community wall, which is more on the museum program side, that we will work with uh, local art groups to be able to change and have a program to install art installation right on the street. So that would be, you know, kind of, you know, vandalism free so that we can enjoy it for longer. So all of these three levels is trying to really activate that street and these two corners. Great, well thank you all for joining us tonight and we look forward to seeing you soon again. Thank you, Kulikai.